Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook, and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. It's been another flattish old week in the market, albeit with concerns about possible escalation in the Middle East, seeing oil prices and gold firming a little towards the end of the week. The Japanese equity market was the standout performer, up more than 6% on the week in local currency terms, followed by the S&P 500 up around 1.8%, NASDAQ 3.1%, and Europe XUK up 0.3%. In the UK, the FTSE All Share was down about 0.5% on the week, although the 250 index, the mid-cap index, recorded a small positive gain. There was mixed news in the gilts market, where around a third of issues saw their prices rise, while most longer-dated issues moved in the opposite direction. Their yields were going up, and as a result, the yield curve has steepened a little. Of note elsewhere was the continued strength of Bitcoin following US regulatory approval of the first spot Bitcoin exchange-traded funds. The cryptocurrency reached its highest level for two years. Against this backcloth, the Investment Trust Index was down marginally by about 0.4%, despite gainers outnumbering losers by around 4 to 3 on the list of around 320 trusts that I look at, excluding VCTs. The average discount has widened a little to around 14.7% at the start of trading yesterday. It was another strong week for Seraphim Space, ticker SSIT, which is up 29% already this year, and double-digit gains from Hydrogen 1, Biopharma Credit and Geiger Counter. At the other extreme, we saw Digital 9, the two biggest battery storage trusts, and Henderson Diversified Income heading the list of decliners, all down more than 5% on the week. Seven trusts out of the 300 or so that I say I follow regularly saw their shares hit 10-year highs this week, which is always a notable landmark. They include Pershing Square Holdings, Rockwood Strategic, two Indian trusts, Ashoka India and Aberdeen New India, The Indian stock market has been a standout performer recently. And Invesco Select Global Equity Income. Perhaps, however, the most significant news this week for any shareholder in investment trusts is the disclosure that uh, more than 300 firms have responded to a request by the Treasury for recommendations on how to change the cost disclosure rules. You'll recall that the Chancellor said in the autumn statement that uh, The government would be addressing this and asking the FCA to introduce interim measures if necessary. But the Treasury's request for response went out on January the 5th, giving the industry five days to respond. They've rallied round with the London Stock Exchange in the lead and more than 119 investment companies, 33 investors, 25 brokers and 13 research firms have added their names to the response, along with a number of MPs and so on. So it really looks as if there may be some action coming pretty soon on this cost disclosure issue, which has been such a drag on investment trust performance, or at least so many in the industry believe, over the last couple of years and contributed heavily to the additional derating that has happened in the view of many. So we'll be looking out for what comes back out of the Treasury as a response to this new initiative. In the podcast today, I will be talking to Ken Watton, Manager of Strategic Equity Capital, ticker SEC, about the prospect for UK smaller companies as we head into the new year. Before that, though, it's the turn of Alistair Lang, the CEO of CG Asset Management, the Manager of Capital Gearing Trust, ticker CGT, the popular Absolute Return Trust. We will be talking about its recent performance, the uh, recent issues it's had with the implementation of its zero discount policy which has seen the shares move to a rare discount over the past year, and its views on the year just gone and the positive opportunities investment trusts that he and his colleagues see in 2024. There were only two results of note this week from Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth, ticker ADIG, which the directors are planning to wind up after several years of disappointing performance, and a Trato on-site energy, ticker ROOF, R-O-O-F, a specialist clean energy trust which has struggled to gain much traction since its IPO in November 
2021. Uh, it at least reported a positive NAV total return for its latest 12-month period of 4.6% while uh, the Aberdeen Diversified and Income Trust's return was just 0.4%. Uh, there were further updates from around a dozen trusts, including LXI REIT, which has agreed its merger terms with London Metric, another property company, Gore Street Energy Storage, one of the battery storage trusts that saw its shares sell off this week, Home REIT and Caledonian Investments. Alliance Trust, meanwhile, is monitoring the situation at Jupiter Asset Management, whose star UK manager, Ben Whitmore, who manages a chunk of Alliance Trust's multi-managing portfolio, is leaving to set up his own fund management boutique later this year. We have an expanded summary of the latest news from Trustland in the new longer weekly email we now send to subscribers to the Money Makers Circle, together with uh, some market commentary and our latest trust profile, which this week features Witten, the multi-manager Global Trust. This will be followed next week by Sequoia Economic Infrastructure Income, ticker SEQI, a renewable energy trust. There's also a summary of the most prominent names highlighted in the latest annual recommendations from three of the leading broking houses that uh, came out this week. So I hope you might give the new weekly email a try. So next on to my conversation with Alistair Lang, the CEO of CG Asset Management which is the manager for the Capital Gearing Trust, ticker CGT. Now, it's been not your greatest year, I think it's fair to say, the last 12 months, uh, Alistair. Why don't you just sort of characterise it first of all, and then we might talk about one or two of the specific issues the Trust has had and go on to talk about more interesting things like the market and so on. So how would you characterise uh, 2023 as far as Capital Gearing Trust is concerned? Well, I mean, the first thing, Jonathan, not to correct you, but there is nothing more interesting than Capital Gearing Trust. So yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Let's start there. Uh, yeah, over the 12 months, the NAV return was 2%. That is certainly well behind the exciting parts of the US equity markets. But at least we made some progress. I think a lot of bond-heavy portfolios made limited progress in the uh, in a 12 months that was characterised by rising bond yields. So the underlying portfolio was satisfactory. I think uh, return prospects are, are much stronger from here. But um, I think the the main issue really was around the share price performance and the functioning of the discount control mechanism that the uh, company runs. Shall I dive into that? Please do. I mean, let's just uh, remind people that Capital Gearing Trust is one of the pioneers of adopting a, a zero discount control policy. You weren't the first to do that, but you certainly have been very active in doing that. And you've uh, followed it religiously over the last several years. But you, you had a problem in 2023. So perhaps you might just explain, remind us what the problem was and what you've had to do to try and fix it. I think Personal Assets Trust definitely was the pioneer of this structure, which essentially means that the company will buy in shares close to just below NAV to ensure a discount doesn't widen out. The purpose of that is to protect shareholders from, you know, in, in periods where you could have muted performance in the underlying portfolio, you don't want additional losses coming about from a discount merging. So it's the company's practice to buy shares in the market in whatever size is necessary to maintain the rating of the trust and avoid a discount appearing. And the company has bought back in excess of 100 million pounds. It was, it was active alongside a number of other similar kind of trusts. There was quite a lot of redemptions essentially across asset managers last year. But unfortunately, we had an issue that emerged in October, which was frankly a mistake by the company. It was a highly technical mistake in order to continue our buybacks. We needed to recategorize some of our reserves. We had the funds available, we had the cash available, but under company's law, you need a certain type of reserve in order to distribute capital and a buyback is counted as distribution of capital. So this had been overlooked and we had to go to the courts to get permission to recategorize that capital. But in the process, uh, really over the 12 months, our share price derated from a 2% premium to around a three and a half to four percent discount, and that's certainly wider than we would have liked it. So there was a negative share price return, even though we actually had a positive 
NAV return. So that was yeah, a disappointment. A- and that was almost entirely therefore due to the fact that you were no longer able to buy back shares until this uh, issue has been cleared up. Is that right? You'd exhausted the capacity or was it a bit more complicated than that? That's correct. It's absolutely correct. The board and the manager remain absolutely square behind this policy. We just need to get through the court process. That process is underway now. The board have said that they expect it to be rectified in the early part of this year. We're hoping it's going to be a matter of weeks from now. Then we will be able to redeploy the share buybacks and improve the ratings. Not only are we optimistic about the returns prospect of the uh, portfolio, but uh, in a rare case for Capital Gearing Trust, there is also the prospect of discount tightening. I think it's fair to say that since you introduced this policy, it's been very effective in ensuring the shares have not traded a discount on the whole for a long, long time, so many years, until about 12 months ago. So is this anything to do with the fact that um, Capital Gearing was set up in Northern Ireland rather than in the UK? Uh, well, it is an interesting kind of legacy of the company that it, it, it is a Northern Irish company. I think it's fair to say that there's less of this kind of activity going through the Northern Irish courts than, for example, the English and Welsh courts. And the Scottish courts are also very active in investment trust kind of legal matters. Although I think we have to put our hands up as a company and say that probably the fundamental issue actually sat with the administration of the company itself we're putting it right, and we are absolutely determined that the trust will regain its historic rating. I guess what you're hoping is that some people will, if they can see a resolution coming and they can see the discount narrowing back towards a premium or being around NAV, that it might start to narrow because people are anticipating that. Yeah, we've already seen that happening as we get closer to the resolution date. It is naturally uh, coming in. There's a bit further to go. Let's move on from that particular local issue. And let's talk about the markets. You got a 2% total return last year, and you've done obviously better than that the previous year. You avoided the worst kind of declines that many investment trusts saw in 2022. So over a two-year view, you reckon that you're delivering your mandate still? It has certainly been a challenging period. Our mandate focuses on wealth preservation first and foremost. And we are close to our all-time high, but we are still a few percentage points below it certainly on a total return basis. We've not done too badly. On the other hand, there has been some inflation in the period and that really needs to be uh, recognised. But I think if we take a step back, over the last 24 months, you've seen essentially a 20-year bond bull market unwind. And we can talk about bonds in more detail, but the high-level summary is that bond yields today are offering historic, normal type of yields We think they're quite attractive, really. So there has just been an extraordinary repricing in the bond market, whereas the equity market is sitting close to all-time highs. That has been the backdrop. Against that, we're fairly happy as a defensive portfolio that holds a majority in bonds that we are somewhere close to our all-time highs. And off the back of this repricing, we're excited about uh, future prospects. Is it fair to say, though, that the world economy didn't perform the way that you had, I think, at least worried about? A lot of people thought there was going to be a recession last year in the US in particular. Some people didn't think that interest rates would go as high as they did. Do you think you were wrong in your analysis, or is it just a case of things are going to happen just with a little bit of a lag compared to what uh, you might have thought at the beginning of last year? Um, we, like many others, thought that we were going into a global recession last year. I mean, it's probably fair to point out the Eurozone as a whole is very close to recession. The UK is also fairly sluggish. China had a very weak growth. In some ways, what has been extraordinary has been the strength of the US market, and we completely underestimated that. Uh, I don't think we were alone in that. But as you rightly point out, There were six interest rate rises in the first half of last year. So the other thing we got really incredibly wrong, unfortunately, is we just didn't think the stock market could perform in the face of that kind of monetary tightening onslaught. In fact, a lot of the weakness in 2022, a lot of the narrative around it had been that you've got this very long duration cash flows in tech businesses and the discount rate had increased. But actually, when the discount rate did increase, 
the narrative changed to we're very excited about AI. You've got six stocks in there, particularly that drove the market, all of the kind of FANGs and, and NVIDIA, the kind of FANG plus stocks. Interestingly, those there are six stocks there that are now worth more than the combined market cap of the UK market, Japan. And there's another market thrown in there. I can't even remember which one it is, but it's just extraordinary, the, the scale and the success of these businesses and uh, the ratings that they've gone back to. And yeah, that is not a theme that we were on top of. What are your thoughts about this year coming up then from that kind of global macro perspective? We've got an election coming up. We've got interest rates coming down. We may have some giveaway tax cuts in one or two countries, <laughs> I dare say. A lot of elections happening this year. Is that going to be enough to stave off trouble or are we still perhaps a little bit still living in a bit of a fool's paradise as far as the US market is concerned anyway? Well, given our prognostications this time 12 months ago, you might want to aim off anything that we say. But um, actually, just before we jumped on this call, it's Thursday as we record this, the US inflation numbers came out. Core inflation came in at 3.9%, which was actually 02 ahead of where economists were expecting the headline inflation 3.4%. Again, that was 02 ahead of where economists were forecasting. So, you know, it's got a slightly sticky feel to it. And we're in this situation where core inflation, that is inflation excluding energy and food, is higher than the headline. And that's because energy prices have come down a lot over the last 12 months. And that's really been an important factor in bringing down headline inflation. But core inflation over the last 12 months in the US is only down about 1.5%. It remains at 3.9% almost twice the target level. And there are signs that it's proving really quite sticky. So your statement there was predicated on the fact that interest rates are coming down. I think looking ahead, you know, it it is quite possible that inflation continues its downward trend. But I think that is most likely to occur if the economy is slowing down. And there is some sense that the labour market particularly is weakening in in the US. Uh, The Fed commented right at the end of last year that it was actually starting to turn its mind towards interest rate cuts because some of the momentum had come out of the economy. So we'd say central banks are probably in a tough place. I think the world in which inflation is coming down rapidly from this point here is probably one of a very slow economy, and that might be a tough backdrop for equities. But if the economy does prove to be as resilient as it has this year, then I wouldn't be at all surprised to see inflation staying pretty sticky. That might mean that interest rates are coming down less fast than the market has forecast. And again, you can see that that could be a situation that would have some challenge for for equities, particularly with valuations as where they are. So we are not particularly bullish for prospects. Uh, We were taken completely by surprise at the last 12 months, but we wouldn't say certainly for the US that... I mean, never say never, but if it has another year like the last year, I think valuations would be pushing right up to the kind of most extreme levels we saw in the dot-com bubble or in the everything bubble in 2021. So basically, it's a bit too early to declare victory, shall we say, over you know whether you talk about soft landings or no landings, or whatever kind of landings we're talking about. The market, you know, towards the end of last year, seemed to got very excited at a nice end of year rally, mm-hmm. and suddenly everybody was talking about interest rate cuts. But um, it might be a bit too early to declare victory, as I say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's quite possible that things have got a bit ahead of themselves. And, you know, I think certainly looking at the bond market, you would say that that immaculate disinflation is priced in. Uh, Break-evens are a measure of inflation expectations, and they seem to suggest that inflation will come back down to 2% and that there'll be six interest rate cuts this year. That is a very... I would say, fragile or very bullish conclusion baked into markets there. Our sense is if the economy is going to stay on the road, then inflation is going to be higher than that. And so interest rates will need to be higher than that. Or if inflation is going to come down to 2%, if the bond market is correct and there's going to be six interest rate cuts coming up, then that's because we're in a recession. 
there is a real disconnect. I think we just wrote our year-end review where you'd say that the bond market uh, appears to be being uh, paranoid and the equity market uh, euphoric. And I suspect there seems scope really for disappointment uh, in a number of different ways. Following on from that is the key question, perhaps, how much do you have in risk assets and how much do you want to have in the bond market in particular? What kind of bonds do you want to own? Short duration, long duration, index link, non-index link. So what have you actually done? Always the most interesting question to ask, rather, what do you think? What have you done? How have you changed your portfolio if we compare it to, say, where it is now to where it was a year ago? What's contributed to that 2% NAV return you were talking about earlier? In Capital Gearing Trust, we invest across government bonds, credit and uh, equities. And those equities that we invest into are largely investment trusts, although we do use some ETFs. So we invest across large swathes of the market. So we can just maybe take those different parts separately. We have relatively low weightings in equities for the reasons I've already outlined. Where we are invested, we are very invested towards value markets. That's to say the UK and Japan and investment trusts on discounts. So how has those equity portfolios changed over the last 12 months? Well, the overall weighting has not changed terribly much. We remain with a pretty low weighting of of around 25% of the portfolio in equities. But the makeup has changed. 12 months ago, we had very high weightings in energy and very big weightings in Japan. We continue to have reasonable weightings in those, but we've sold down within the year both of those areas. Energy performed very well in the first half of last year, and we were selling down off the back of that. Japan had generally a strong year. Uh, I think it was up about 20 plus percent, at least in yen terms. So again, after a strong run, we've uh, reduced a bit there. Where we've been investing into, and this might be one for a bit more of a discussion, is we've increased our holdings in investment trusts. And that spans across the conventional investment trust sector, where there's a range of opportunities with quite wide discounts. And the alternative investment sector, particularly infrastructure, we've been adding there. There were some really quite stark issues in those markets that were being worked through last year. And whilst they were not strongly performing assets, there were some what seemed like very attractive opportunities there to add to our positions. So it was really a year of recycling through those equity positions. As someone who spends a lot of time looking at the investment trust market, were you surprised that the discounts have widened as much as they did during the course of last year until the last quarter, when obviously we had quite a a nice little rally there re-rating across Mm. the sector? Uh, Were you surprised that the discounts went quite as wide as they did? Particularly when, as you say, certainly some of the longer duration assets were being priced up in the equity market in the in the tech sector. It was quite the opposite in some of the long duration investment trusts in the alternative space, at least. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely a very marked feature of last year. This kind of feeling of, of disconnect. It was a very, very challenging year, really, in the investment trust sector. Alternative income had its own very specific issues. There were some specific issues Digi9 and Song, Hypnosis. But on the whole, a number of the alternative areas actually performed quite well. Infrastructure assets are pretty stable on the whole. They delivered uh, reasonable returns. If you look at private equity, interestingly, the earnings growth there was between 15 and 30%, really, depending on which vehicle you're looking at. And in both of those cases, there were lots of disposals made at or in some cases at premiums to the underlying NAVs. So again, this is something we wouldn't necessarily have anticipated at the beginning of the year, but the underlying portfolios from a number of these alternative assets did well, but the ratings of them got hugely marked down. And this was something that did start in October 22. You had bond markets re-rating, you had large movements of investor capital from alternative income type vehicles into the bond market. If you looked at the kind of data that Interactive Investor put out, this time a couple of years ago, you could see at the top of their retail buy lists, they had lots of high income investment trusts. And then about 12 months ago, that flipped around to the January 24 guild. 
And you could almost picture large movements from retail and institutional investors taking money out of a market that had grown a lot and reallocating it towards the government bond market. And this created a very specific technical issue when you had essentially a lot of small cap stocks, these investment trusts trade like small cap stocks. So even though the underlying assets did broadly what investors hoped they would do, you had this technical backdrop, which meant there was a huge re-rating. And in some ways, Capital Gearing Trust was also part of that general trend even though our discount movement was was less marked, we went from a 2% premium, which is roughly the top end of our kind of discount range, to a two discount at the bottom end. And this was a big reallocation of capital going on, even though the underlying assets have done okay. So it, it was a surprise to us. It is a major issue. On the other hand, it is a significant opportunity because given the underlying assets are doing okay, then if you accept that, then these discounts are attractive entry points. There is this debate going on about whether some of that derating was due to what we might call structural issues. In other words, the fact that the minimum size that some of the wealth managers need, all those and liquidity issues, the sort of structural problems of the investment trust sector may have contributed to the derating. Or it may just have been a kind of normal supply and demand situation which will will reverse. The difference being that if it doesn't reverse because of structural reasons, then there's a more long-standing problem, I, I would suggest. Or it could just be a normal market cycle where things go to an extreme. Would that be roughly right? Yes. So our expectation is that this is more in the realms of a normal market cycle. But that's not to say that it will necessarily reverse quickly. As you pointed out in the last quarter of last year, there was actually quite a marked re-rating. But I wouldn't necessarily forecast that if we speak in six months' time, the discounts will have totally disappeared. It does remind me a bit of after the global financial crisis, really, there was a three, four year process after that. It took to 2014, 2015 for an equilibrium to come back into the market. And then we saw a number of years actually of quite significant issuance. And, you know, it just is the way that these kind of markets tend to operate. The pendulum swings over and swings back. But I think what made 2023 quite interesting, really, is that the pendulum was swung right over towards the crisis side of the dial in investment companies. At the same time, the tech pendulum was swung completely the other direction towards euphoria. And I think we would see that there's a prospect for the pendulums to swing back in both cases. So we would hope for a period of outperformance of these kinds of assets. But it may take a few years for that to come through in its entirety. Undoubtedly, there is another factor overlaid over the top, and it's by no means the main factor. But you would have heard a lot of commentary, I'm sure, about the general travails of the UK market. There's specific points around investment trusts, around cost disclosure and whether the way wealth managers are forced to make cost disclosures for investment trusts at an unfair disadvantage. I think that is is a factor at play here, but also just the fact that the UK market as a whole is quite deeply unloved at the moment. And investment trusts are a part of that market. They're also disproportionately invested into UK shares, but This all screams to us as value on top of value on top of value. Uh, And this can take quite a lot of time to unwind. But history says if you buy good value and you're patient, the rewards will eventually flow your way. People have been saying the UK market is cheap for a long time and it's remained cheap. So it raises the question whether if you're an investor, whether you should do the sensible thing and buy something very cheap and then be patient. But of course, people find it quite difficult to do that, particularly when there are other things going on which look a lot more exciting and will uh, make them maximise their regret, if you want it that way, by not pursuing them. I would say with the UK market, it hasn't just remained cheap, it's actually got cheaper. I think the whole of the FTSE All Shares is something like an 11 PE. I just find that staggering. You'll excuse me with a little uh, shaggy dog story, but I remember... I started my investing career in private equity and I remember speaking to some of my senior partners then, in fact, the chairman of the private equity fund I was working in. He was explaining to me about investing in the 1980s and, you know, picking over all of these companies that were incredibly beaten up where the whole market cap was the uh, same as certain fixed assets on the balance sheet and cash and 
you got the cash flow essentially for free. And I remember sitting there thinking, I'm not sure why you're telling me this because I'm never going to see this in my whole career. You know, markets are not like this anymore. It just feels to me like the UK is a bit like that. And, you know, Japan was in that situation 10 years ago. And actually the Japanese market over the last decade has had a very good run. It's not at the top of anyone's list, but it just got so cheap that it's actually had a fairly decent run, not as good as the US, but um, better than many other markets. So, I mean, that it, it is very difficult to be patient, but that's one thing I think that uh, CG Asset Management were quite constitutionally well <laughs> designed for. Ultimate, infinite patience. Okay, so let's just talk about some of the, just mention a few names. I mean, you talked about uh, adding to some positions in the alternatives and perhaps switching a little bit in the equity side. What sort of things have you been adding to the portfolio? Have you added to the portfolio in, say, let's just take infrastructure for an example, first of all? So the nice thing about times like these, when you had a fairly indiscriminate derating of names, is that you can really focus on the high quality operators in the market. So in the infrastructure market, for example, there's been a lot of issuance activity. There are some small names that are on quite deep discounts, although they have got quite esoteric portfolios, maybe not that many assets in them. They could be deep value opportunities, but you know, there's definitely risk around the level of concentration. The last 12 months has really offered an opportunity to buy into the high quality names that went on to a discount. So in there, there were two names that are new into our portfolio. That's BBGI or Bilfinger Burger Global Infrastructure. That historically has always had a very high rating. I don't think it's actually likely to be the highest returning infrastructure fund, but it's a very high quality global portfolio of uh, PFIs, you know, toll roads, prisons, government-backed cash flows. So uh, we're very uh, excited to build up a position there at a discount because it hasn't been at a discount for essentially the, like, the previous decade. Another new position we built up was 3i Infrastructure. Again, one of the real banner names. I, I certainly can't remember it being on a discount in the last decade other than maybe a very short period over COVID. Again, we built up a position there and we also increased positions in INPP and Hickel infrastructure. On the renewable side, UK Wind is one of our largest positions. That's Greencoat, UK Wind. We have pretty broad holdings across the um, renewable infrastructure piece. And is the idea here that you'd hope they'll re-rate and then you might sell them? Or do you think they're actually still worth only if they went back to par? So? It depends precisely on the vehicle that you're looking at. But, you know, these vehicles are yielding really 5 to 6%. We believe that in general terms, they have the capacity to grow their earnings in line with inflation. There are different kind of assets in these, but let's just say as a general rule, the underlying asset value can be maintained in real terms, i.e. they are retaining sufficient earnings to keep their NAVs growing in line with inflation. So we think that these broadly priced at around 5 to 6% real yields. So, you know, inflation plus 5 or 6%. That's the kind of returns that historically equity markets have delivered. Uh, the US equity market has been the strongest global equity market over its entire existence. It's delivered about 6 real. Uh, kind of European equity markets have delivered between 4 and 5 real. So I think these are examples of stocks really where you have very high quality of stable infrastructure assets that are priced to deliver returns that are at or above normal level of returns for the equity market. So on a risk adjusted basis, this looks very good to us. Now, obviously, we hope they re-rate. And if they did, depending how far we went, yes, we probably would sell some. But in terms of if they don't re-rate, then we have stocks with high and sustainable dividends, and that's also fine. So that's the general infrastructure. Just a quick word about the property sector. That's actually also re-rated from the middle of the year. You had quite a lot of property trust going into the downturn, and you sold a few last time we spoke. What are your thoughts about that now? I mean, we've seen quite a lot of takeovers and acquisitions and mergers coming through there. We've heard this week about the agreement of terms for the uh, LXI London metric deal. What are your thoughts generally about the property sector now, given that it has perked up a lot since the last few weeks anyway? 
There's a lot of similarity, really, in our view, between the infrastructure story and the property story. In both cases, you've got asset-backed cash flows with high levels of revenue visibility. When I make that comment, I'm talking very much on the kind of meds, beds and sheds kind of areas that we have very much focused on. I think it's a slightly different story for retail and commercial, which actually had very good years, but that was on the back of getting absolutely beaten up in 2022. So I think those stories are a bit different in retail and commercial. That looks a bit more speculative to us, but you know, prices did get so low that there may be good opportunities there. It's just not a part of the market we're focused on. We're much more focused on long lease properties of the sort that are quite widely available in the investment trust area, whether it's care homes, whether it's long leases to supermarkets, to healthcare or to logistics. And these assets to us look like they're priced to deliver high single digit IRRs or again, kind of five, six percent real returns, which are just extremely high returns for uh, low risk assets. So we continue to think that they're quite attractive. I just think that the opportunity in infrastructure, if anything, might be a little more attractive. So it's really in the infrastructure area that we've been adding. For example, we bought a position in LXI. We have held it in the past, but we'd sold out, but we bought a position there. And as you say, it's it's now merging with London Metric. A number of these property companies are looking at ways that they can improve their rating, whether it's through mergers, whether it's looking at asset sales and share buybacks. I don't think any of these are going to be quick fixes But I think there is a wide acceptance among boards that they need to be proactive in managing in these discounts. I mean, it has been odd, hasn't it, as just a general comment. If you look at something like Tritax Big Box or something more special like PRS REIT, who basically they haven't really done anything different, but they've had been through this extraordinary price cycle where Tritax Big Box went from a huge premium to a huge discount in the course of about nine months. It doesn't really suggest a particularly efficient market, if I can put it that way. No, I think the reality is that um, the whole of UK small and mid cap has struggled. And a lot of these stocks, they're essentially FTSE 250 stocks, these investment companies, and they're, they're caught up in some of the same trends that is universal across UK small caps. But I think, you know, these valuations have got to a point now where they're just out now attractive. So um, I think you're paid to wait with decent dividends. And I think there is an opportunity for re-rating. Finally, let's then talk about the private equity trust. You mentioned that you used to work in private equity. Here, the story is slightly different, isn't it? Because there's been this extraordinary disparity in the way that uh, private equity trusts are rated. At one end, you've got some of the big, well-established names trading as wide as 40 50% discounts. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you've got some of the more favoured private equity trusts, You know, smaller ones like Literary Capital trading at around par. And then you've got the Oakley Capitals and uh, people like that who are trading somewhere in between different ratings. Yeah. And then I think you had a connection with HG Capital. I mean, they've gone out to an unprecedented discount, I think, for recent times. So it does yeah. seem to be all over the place. Do you think, again, the market is, is sort of pricing all these different vehicles correctly, or are there actually quite a lot of anomalies out there? Well, I think the key story last year, certainly if we rewind the clock, go back 12 months, is that investors were understandably extremely concerned about a double whammy, essentially interest rates going up, which um, given that a lot of private equity companies are quite highly levered, that clearly impacts their earnings after interest. And also there were quite widespread recessions predicted and the thought was that would put their earnings under pressure. That made total sense, that assessment. You You can see why investors were extremely concerned. I mean, as it happens, so many of these private equity assets are in pretty robust market sectors, whether it's technology or whether it's healthcare, certain areas of precision manufacturing, other other areas that have actually performed pretty well. And revenues, revenue growth, earnings growth has held up extremely well. Earnings growth across these vehicles seems to be between 15 and 30% up. So that's extremely helpful. And the equity market did very well. So uh, the comparable valuation metrics were supportive. 
And where these funds have exited, they've normally done it at premium to their underlying NAVs. So there's been quite a lot of evidence to support NAV levels. Everyone thought that they were going to fall and they've actually been well maintained. It's been extremely impressive, really. So I think it's hard to make the case now that um, private equity NAVs are materially overstated in the way that everyone was concerned 12 months ago. So just to kind of sum that up, it has been a period when there have been these extraordinary extremes. And I can't help feeling that there are quite a lot of anomalies in there in terms of relative valuations anyway that people might be able to exploit. Notwithstanding the fact, as you said, that there are very different uh, characteristics across the different portfolios. So 2024 could be, still be quite a challenging year, but there are more opportunities out there than there were perhaps a year ago. Would that be a final comment you might agree with? I would absolutely agree with that. I think we're finding it hard to be really enthusiastic about the kind of broad equity market. We're specifically nervous about the US, whether it's got ahead of itself. When the the US sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold is how we think about equity markets in general. So if the US is going to have a muted year, we wouldn't necessarily expect better value markets to go roaring away. But we can see reasons why high quality stable equities with decent dividend yields will make some forward progress. And looking at capital gearing trust portfolio, you know, we have about 75% of it in a combination of cash, short, medium, and a little bit of long dated bonds, which collectively should deliver for 5% underlying without uh, too much risk. So, Yeah, I think it should be a year of hopefully reasonable progress, even if equity markets are quite weak. You know, the bond market backdrop is much more attractive than it was 12 or 18 months ago. So, yeah, I think investors should remain diversified. I think they should consider holding more bonds than they would have done uh, historically. And I can see reasons to be concerned about equities, but I think overall returns should be reasonable. So that was Alistair Lang, the CEO of CG Asset Management, the manager of Capital Gearing Trust and a regular guest of ours on the podcast, talking about the outlook for the markets and for the investment trust sector in particular. Next up, I uh, had a chance to have a chat with Ken Watton, who is the lead manager of Strategic Equity Capital, ticker SEC which is a specialist small cap trust managed by Gresham House. Ken's been pursuing a particular small cap strategy at different places for many, many years and has been manager of this particular trust since September 2020. Ken, let's just kick off. You haven't been on the podcast before. So why don't you just give us a very brief overview of what your strategy is, how you apply what you call private equity methods to managing a listed UK small cap portfolio? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. As you rightly say, we take a a slightly differentiated approach to investing in public companies, particularly in the small cap area, um, which we describe as taking a private equity approach to investing in public companies. What we mean by that is, first and foremost, really focusing on the business fundamentals of those companies. So so acting as if we were buying and, and owning the whole business, not just the marginal shares and we can trade in the market. And so really thinking about the long-term opportunity, the, the quality of the management team, the financial fundamentals, and really trying to look for good quality companies with a competitive advantage that we think can create value over the long term. And then importantly, buying that business at a price which we can rationalise an attractive return. And we're targeting about a 15% compound return through the cycle for SEC. The second thing that's really important is that we place a lot of emphasis on our private equity network. So I spent 12 years working, managing public company portfolios, but within a mid-market UK private equity firm called Living Bridge before coming to Gresham House. And so we really tried to build the investment process, leveraging the network that a private equity firm typically has. And we brought that network across with us to Gresham House, and we've expanded and enhanced it significantly since we've been here. And it really means trying to access people who have expertise in particular sectors or particular functional areas to help us with the due diligence when we're evaluating a new investment, but also importantly, supporting our active engagement strategy once we have made an investment. And SEC, I guess, is distinct relative to other small cap trusts in that it's very concentrated. So we typically have somewhere plus or minus around 20 holdings, of which the majority of the value, usually sort of 75% plus, is in the top 10 holdings. So it's very concentrated. Those top 10 are 
high conviction and we try to build the material equity stakes in those businesses so that we have an influential position from which to use as a platform for engagement and then we try to leverage our network to help us to do that. So is it fair to say that you are essentially trying to take advantage of inefficiencies in the market as far as uh, small cap companies are concerned? Obviously, we know a lot of issues around liquidity and small cap trusts <coughs> and the fact that uh, the UK market generally, and small cap in particular, is under-owned and unloved at the moment. So you're basically trying to take advantage of mispricing in the market. Yes, I think that there's a structural and a cyclical opportunity in, in small cap. The cyclical opportunity is that currently UK stocks are out of favour and, and particularly UK smaller companies and therefore they're trading at, at big discounts and there are a lot of companies that are good quality businesses but are trading at prices significantly below what we think that the long-term value could be. But then structurally, small cap is an area of the market that is less well-researched, is less well-owned, as you say, and therefore it's often that you can find good quality businesses that have good growth potential, but where that growth potential is not really being recognised yet because not enough people know about them. And if you buy them at the right point, you know, as they grow and as they demonstrate that that's the case, and more people start to look at them and they, they get bigger, they get more liquid, and then they should get re-rated. But at the moment, that structural opportunity is enhanced by the cyclical opportunity. Right. But there still remains the need. You have to do more than just own the shares. You have to do something actively with the management, is, is what you're saying, whether that's marketing or whether it's actually running the business. What are the kind of priorities when you go yeah, in? So, so that we don't pretend that we know how better than an executive in a particular company or sector to how to run their business. But we do have the benefit of seeing hundreds and hundreds of businesses every year. And, and therefore, we know what good looks like. So we, we, we try to think about what best practice looks like based on our experience of lots of businesses, both public, but also the Gresham has have a private equity business as well. So we see many hundreds of, of private companies as well in the same sectors. And where we seek to, to actively engage is twofold, really, what we're trying to achieve. First one is de-risking and sort of, sort of downside risk protection. So trying to ensure that businesses that we think have a good opportunity and a good team and a good strategy, make sure they don't come unstuck by doing the wrong thing. So challenging the strategy, ensuring that they are focused on allocating capital and resource efficiently, and, and then supporting them in whatever way we can to exit execute that strategy effectively. And the second bit is try to unlock or support the upside potential. And that's about supporting management with capital. So being a cornerstone investor that can support uh, fundraising for acquisitions, for example, focusing on board composition. So is the governance right? Do they have the right skills and experience around the boardroom table? And if they don't, uh, then you know, we've got a great network of high caliber individuals and we can potentially introduce people who can help them. Are the incentives right? So do the management incentives align with the strategy the business is, is undertaking and also long-term shareholder value creation and you know, a, a lot of times that's not the case we would focus on that and then you know, we have a lot of functional expertise around the business you know, our private equity business engages with consultants and due diligence providers and, and execs and non-execs of, of businesses that can potentially add value to these companies as consultants or, or, or get involved in the businesses so we've got a lot of strings to our bow and we need to convince the management team of the companies that we're credible and that, that we understand how we can help them and then hopefully collaboratively sort of give them access to that network and that insight and that best practice view so that they can do the right things and either do it more quickly or we can help to capitalize that. Because these companies are already listed, they've already taken the decision to go public, as it were. So would it be wrong to describe them as fallen angels or are they kind of angels hidden behind perhaps, a, well, I can't remember what the exact question, angels in aspic, I suppose it's something like that. Yeah. There's a real mix. I mean, this is a universe of, of potential investments, which is pretty large in terms of number of companies. So we've got a lot of businesses we can choose from. So we don't need to go for turnaround situations which are inherently high risk and where it takes a lot of resource to, to, to go in and change things. We're not activist investors trying to go in and shake things up and cause issues. We're trying to find either underappreciated or unloved businesses or, or just businesses that are just not that well known that are doing the right things, but that's not really yet being reflected in the valuation. And so trying to find those companies and then where possible supporting the teams to deliver the strategy. And we think that on a three to five year view, which is typically our holding period, that we can support those businesses to unlock value, whether that's just by doing what they do and demonstrating consistently that they can do that until people notice. Those are the easy ones. Or it might be that there's a particular you know, opportunity for them to divest a non-core asset or to make an acquisition which can be transformative or introduce a new a new person or a, a new geography or something that can be the difference between the business moving along at a steady pace and really sort of starting to, to add value. So every situation is different. But of course, when people think about private equity style approach, they think about adding debt and so on. 
there's no debt in the no gearing in the trust. Uh, yeah. But at the portfolio level, what is typically your strategy? Is part of the strategy so, so, gearing up or not? No, it's, it's absolutely not. Most of the businesses that we own in the trust are either completely ungeared, either have net cash on the balance sheet or, or the gearing is low. We don't typically like highly geared businesses unless we sort of see a really clear short-term path to de-gearing, which you know, that might be an equity raise which we support, which kind of unlocks a rating. But we're not relying on debt to juice the returns for the trust. We are focusing on businesses that can grow profits either through revenue growth and operational gearing kicking in over a period accretive acquisitions or margin recovery if something has gone wrong in the past and they're, and they're on a sort of a path to improve that. And then we're also looking for profitable cash generated businesses. So if they have debt, the cash generation will pay down the debt and that goes through equity value or businesses that can build cash and return that to shareholders through buybacks or uh, through dividends. And then lastly, we're typically looking for businesses where we think there's an opportunity for them to deliver a, an increase in the rating over time because they're doing something strategically valuable. And so whilst we're not buying businesses explicitly because we think they're going to get taken over, you know, we have had a significant number of takeovers in the portfolio over the years. And the reason for that is because the sort of high quality businesses and high quality characteristics we're looking for, they're the same characteristics that private equity value highly and indeed corporate buyers are looking for. So we're looking for the same thing. So if we can find them at valuation multiples that are attractive, there's a decent chance that if the stock market doesn't start to recognise that, then you know, you've got a second bite of the cherry, which is that the M&A market might start to recognise it. I think it's fair to say that there are a couple of other trusts in the uh, UK smaller companies sector which are doing on the face of it similar sort of things and talking about Rockwood and uh, Odyssean. How do you view that? I mean, how much overlap is there between what you do and what they're doing? They talk the same talk anyway. Are there differences between you or is there overlap between you? There are similarities and there are differences. I think both of those funds I would consider to be peers of SEC. And so uh, if you're an asset allocator or a wealth manager or, or an individual looking to get access to this type of strategy, you'd probably be considering one or all of those alternatives. Rockwood, we know well, because it, it used to be a fund that was managed by Gresham House. It used to be called Gresham House Strategic. And so typically Rockwood is investing in companies that are a bit smaller than SEC. So SEC is our sweet spot is targeting businesses between a 100 and 300 million market cap at the point when we invest. And Rockwood has historically been focused on businesses slightly smaller than that. And Odyssean companies slightly bigger than that. So the average market capitalization of the portfolio companies within Odyssean is a bit bigger than, than the average market cap of the portfolio companies in SEC. We think that by targeting that sweet spot, given the size of the trust, which is about 170 million of net asset value, plus the fact that we have other small cap funds within Gresham House that potentially can co-invest alongside them, that 100 to 300 million market cap area is the sweet spot because Number one, it's the area which is less well-researched, less well-known, and therefore you get these mispricing opportunities. But secondly, those size of companies, we have a good opportunity to potentially build a meaningful equity stake. So we're typically the largest or one of the largest shareholders in the companies we invest in for SEC. And that gives us the platform to engage and actually make a difference and be listened to. In our view, if we were investing in a billion pound company at the point when we invest, you know, we just can't take such a large equity stake. And then whilst we might say sensible things and be credible, the management team may listen to us and hopefully they will, our level of influence is less than it would be if we own 10% of a company that's smaller. And so that's the approach. So the strategies as articulated are relatively similar, but I think just the execution in terms of where we're focused is a bit different. So that provides some further differentiation, if you like, within the sector. I had a look this morning at the kind of share price performance total return over the last five years, and you're in there at about 10%. Rockwood is slightly ahead of that, and Addition's about the same. But that's mm-hmm. certainly as good as, if not in several cases, better than the kind of larger small cap funds that are out there. I guess that's not a total surprise because you are, by your strategy, at least on conventional metrics, you look riskier anyway, should we say, because you're more concentrated portfolios. So is it the case that if you like to justify investors investing with you, they have to accept a higher degree of risk? Or would you say that actually your approach is is less risky? (laughs) Well, we think it's less risky. I mean, obviously, the stock-specific risk is higher because we're more concentrated than a sort of larger, more typical, diversified small companies fund with 100 holdings. But we try to mitigate the downside risk through 
combination of the due diligence that we do on the company. So we're, we're very focused. We, you know, we have a, a small list of companies, so we try to know them really well, ideally as well or better than everybody else in the market. And then so sort of trying to avoid the pitfalls and mistakes that you make if you've got less time to spend on them. Secondly, the active engagement approach means that we can try and head off risky activities before they happen and before they damage value through our engagement activity and hopefully support those businesses to do well. And if they go off track, because we've got a big stake, we have potential to get involved and put them back on track as well. So we can kind of mitigate the risk after the event if something happens that we hadn't foreseen. So that, for those reasons, we think, although we're more concentrated, we have done a lot of work to mitigate the downside risk. And it's not just me and, and, and my team sort of evaluating these companies. We have an investment committee, which is very experienced with industry experts and, and experienced investors that are not day-to-day managing the trust, but that we discuss and, and sort of go through the, the detailed investment case and the engagement plan on, on an individual investment as we go along. And that's another sort of layer of risk management because we've got bigger stakes. And then I guess the last bit is just the types of things we invest in. So we are investing, whilst they're small, they are profitable, cash generative, low leverage businesses, and we're buying them on undemanding valuation multiples. And so those things all together means that they should be more defensive in a difficult economic environment, which we're in at the moment. And the the downside risk on valuation is lower. And you know, we saw the, the big sell-off in technology and growth stocks at the sort of post-2021 bull market. We didn't sort of suffer the same drawdown as some of the other big funds because we weren't exposed to sort of very high valuations in, in some of those kind of stocks. If I read the uh, annual reports and so on, the board says they have ambitions for this trust. It says the market cap is currently around, what, 150, 160 million. And since you took over, it's fair to say the discount has come in quite a long way with the help of a few buybacks and a few other things um, mm-hmm. and performance. Uh, it's come in from, what, around sort of over 20 to around 7 or 8% now. Yeah. Is one of your ambitions to try and get up to par? Edition has managed to do that with a maintainer zero discount. Is that something that you would like to do and be able to grow the trust through uh, issuance? How big could it become? Clearly, we would love the discount to be gone and, and for the trust to trade at par or, or to premium because that gives you options. Clearly, any future issuance would have to be done in conjunction with the board and shareholders and we have to be convinced that the opportunity was there for us to invest more money if we were to grow the trust. But clearly, we wouldn't it are focus over the last three and a bit years since I've been managing it has been to drive performance, which I think we've managed to do. It's certainly really come through during 2023 in particular. We have introduced the buyback program, which we think is you know is, is a little and often rather than a big bazooka type buyback. So we think that's supportive as sort of having the trust there as a marginal buyer of shares in the market on an ongoing basis. And We've also very actively marketed the trust. So we've gone around the country talking to wealth managers and we're doing marketing events like this to, to try and stimulate interest in the trust. And all of that seems to be working, hence the discounts come in also during a period where actually the average discount on UK smaller company trust has gone out rather than come in. So it's been working. I think that we inherited the trust. We won it in a competitive tender in the beginning of 2020. So we inherited a shareholder register that was not one that we'd created from scratch. And so you know, there's been a a reasonable amount of reshaping and uh, sort of change and dynamism in the shareholder register over the last three years. And you know that contributes to the discount. I think we've got a good base of supportive long-term shareholders now, and, and that's really helpful. And so that, again, should put us in a good position should we get to par and, and be in a position to raise or issue new shares. Hopefully, we've got people who would like to support that, but you know, we're not there yet. Of course, everybody's been talking about how unloved the UK market is, how pension funds don't invest anymore in the UK market, even even at the top end of the market rather than down in the small cap regions. You would say, obviously, your portfolio looks attractive, I'm sure, and has been growing and performing well. But do you actually think that there is potential for a trust that invests so far down the market capitalization scale to see a significant turnaround in attention and investment from larger houses? Is that actually a really? I think we, we just have to keep doing what we're doing. Um, I didn't answer your question about sort of how big could it be. I think the strategy has capacity significantly greater than the current size of the trust, you know, two or three times at least, without changing what we're doing or, or sort of moving into a different target universe. So we think the opportunity is there. The performance has started to come through. I think we just have to keep doing what we're doing and people will notice and we recognise this is not a mainstream, diversified, large trust that everyone's going to want to buy, but we think that it's differentiated enough that there is a place within NASA allocation for, for this kind of strategy. And to your point about the UK market and UK small caps in particular, I think that, you know, the pension fund 
uh, issue has been well flagged in the media in recent times, but it's you know, this is an issue which has been going on for 20 years and it's, I think, largely played out. And hopefully there are some initiatives like the Mansion House reforms that could result in, in money coming back in, you know, fingers crossed and touching words. Um, I think the bigger issue at the moment really is more cyclical than structural. I think it's that the UK market is a bit out of favour valuations are low as a result of that you've had outflows from uk funds and uk small cap funds the us has been a big beneficiary of that at some point the valuation differential will cause people to come back in i think the level of takeover activity that we're seeing in in uk small cap demonstrates that there is value here so certainly in my career and we, we place a lot of emphasis on trying to track this because you know, we're taking this private equity approach to public markets we want to understand what's happening in private markets and we do because we have a private equity business aggression an extensive network in that area the gap between private market transaction multiples and uk listed small cap multiples as i've never seen it as wide as it is now and that's what's driving the takeover activity and we're seeing UK private equity, international private equity, uh, UK and international trade buyers coming in and buying UK small cap companies at the moment. And that's because the valuations relative to the quality is really compelling. We're seeing that, they're seeing that. And we think eventually the market will start realising that and flows will turn the other way. And when they do, it can move positively quite rapidly. And in terms of your own portfolio, your 20 companies or so, have you had any takeovers in the last 12 months? You know, you've seen that, which suggests that your methodology is working if it actually happens, right? Yeah, we've had a number of takeovers in the period since I've been running the trust, but over the last 12 months, we've had three major ones, of which one is not yet completed, one ended up not happening, and one one did happen. So you know, the one which is in process currently is 10 Entertainment Group, which is the UK's number two Tempin Bowling Centre operator, which is really good business, has been growing nicely, it's had a fantastic momentum in terms of its trading post-COVID since things reopened. And that's in the process of, of being taken private by a, a US private equity house at a decent premium. We've, we've made good returns on that. The second one is a company called Tribal, which is an education software business which uh, sells into higher education institutions big universities globally and that was subject to a takeover offer from a trade buyer but actually that has ended up for at least for the time being not happening because some of the larger shareholders in the stock were not happy about about the price that was being offered so that may come back but that's not happened for the time being and then the most significant for us uh, because it was our biggest holding in the trust prior to it happening was medica which was bid for in i think it was march or april last year and it completed in july and medica is a Teleradiology companies as outsourced service provider in the healthcare sector, serving the NHS, the Irish Health Service, but also pharmaceutical companies in the clinical trial area. Really exciting business, structural growth, uh, international in scope, really good management team, fits a lot of the criteria we're looking for. And we built a, a material equity state. We ended up owning 20% of the equity in the company. And we could see that there have been two different private equity transactions in uh, of competitors to Medica at multiples which were 50, 60, 70% higher than the multiple that, that Medica was trading on. So we knew that the margin of safety on valuation was very significant. We didn't necessarily sort of want the company be, to be taken out, but we did encourage the board to evaluate that option and if nothing else to sort of put it side by side with the with the remaining independent and, and staying listed and and, and driving the, the independent strategy just to demonstrate that that was a better option for shareholders and as it turned out they did that and uh, they had a number of approaches for the business and it ended up being taken private by ik partners which is a scandinavian private equity house and that was a big driver of our, our returns for last year well that's a good question so did the bulk of the returns you made in excess of the market, and you did beat the index, did that come from those takeovers rather than from the performance of the other companies? It didn't, actually. And Medica was a big contributor to returns, but the biggest contributor last year was actually XPS Pensions, which is sort of now our largest holding in, in the trust, which is a, an actuarial consultant and uh, pensions administration business, really high quality business in an area which is not cyclical because it's uh, been driven by regulatory drivers and, and uh, it's a, a sort of must-have service where they, where they provide to pension trustees you know, the things like the LDI crisis at the end of 2022 really drove activity and demand for advice which meant that October 22 was their busiest ever month and sort of record revenues 
And you know, we think that this is a business which has a really exciting medium to long term growth trajectory and an opportunity. It's growing double digits at the top line and also demonstrating positive operational gearing and, and generating good cash. So we think it's a good business. We'd happily hold it for the medium to long term, but also in common with many of the holdings and many small cap companies in general, the valuation multiple that it trades on is still a meaningful discount to where transactions have been happening in the same sector for private equity. So there's a number of private equity backed competitors to XPS that have, have transacted at well into the double digit multiples and, and XPS still trades on a single digit AV, but are multiple. So yeah, we think there's good upside there. Just to your question, that was our largest contributor to returns last year, and it wasn't because of a takeover. Okay. Then finally, just looking to this year and beyond, your average holding period, you said, is about five years. So uh, are you turning over the portfolio sort of more than your average at the moment, or is it a case of just sticking with what you've already got? We had a bit of turnover in the first year of me running the trust, which was a bit of repositioning of the portfolio to try and reduce the average market capitalization and also to increase the average equity stake that we held in the trust. I mentioned that earlier, and so we did that in the, in the first stages of me running the trust. We then have had exits in the market in 2021 when we were in a real bull market environment. We had some of the growthier, larger stocks within the portfolio from a market cap perspective where there was significant demand for those shares in the market at high multiples. And so we were able to exit them at really attractive prices and then recycle those proceeds into some more undervalued situations. And then, as we've already discussed, we had takeover offers which have come through and Medica being the biggest which has meant we've had more cash to recycle into new opportunities the good thing is that there are lots of opportunities at the moment because of where the market is and to your point about holding period it's typically three to five years but it does vary and we've certainly got companies at the moment which given where the valuations are we think are vulnerable to takeovers that doesn't mean we want them to happen and the good thing about having a large equity stake is that you typically have a say in that conversation so uh, with Medica, we had 20% of the equity. If we hadn't been happy with the price, then that deal probably wouldn't have happened because we would been able to vote it down. It would have been high risk to launch that transaction without our support, but we, we were taken over the wall sort of ahead of it and, and we provided our commitment to support it. In other situations where we've got sm- smaller stakes, that might not be the case. Okay, so that was Ken Wooden, the Lead Manager of Strategic Equity Capital, ticker SEC. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.